Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of our Cancer Center series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Cancer Center. Before we get started, just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, you may use the chat feature, which is located off your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-host and guest speakers will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. All right, so next I am going to hand it over to Deb Punch. She is the health educator for Mass General Cancer Center, and she is going to introduce you all to today's guest speakers. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today, and thank you, Amy, for starting us off. Today's presentation is entitled Breast Cancer Related Lymphedema Overview, Screening, and Research. And we're lucky to have three wonderful presenters today. Ibby Hausman holds a BA from Harvard University. Amanda Jung has her MPH from Tufts University. And Brooke Jewell holds a BS from Tufts University. All three speakers are clinical research coordinators who joined the Lymphedema Research Program at Mass General Radiology in 2021. Thank you all for being here and um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Devin. And I'll just share our slides. All right, and we can see that okay? Great. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for having us at the Blum Center. My name is Ibby Hausman and myself alongside my coworkers, Brooke and Amanda, will be discussing breast cancer related lymphedema, the overview, the screening program that we have here at Mass General, as well as the research that we are doing. This is our funding. It is important to note that our program is mostly funded philanthropically. We are very thankful to the generous donors who are able to fund our program such that we can provide a free screening service to our patients. So to keep in mind, all of the aspects of our screening program that you'll hear about today are entirely free to our patients at Mass General. The outlined framework of our presentation today is such that I'll begin by explaining what lymphedema is and the typical treatment. Amanda will talk about the screening program and Brooke will conclude with some of our research. So first, what is breast cancer related lymphedema? Breast cancer related lymphedema is arm swelling that can occur after surgery or radiation to the lymph nodes. And this swelling is caused by fluid buildup of lymph. So treatment to the lymph nodes results in an interruption of the lymphatic system, and that can result in the lymph fluid accumulating in the arm, which causes that swelling. The onset is typically within five years, five years post-treatment, but the risk for developing lymphedema is lifelong. So the common signs and symptoms of lymphedema in includes swelling. Again, that is due to the accumulation of lymph in the arm, and this swelling can cause a change in arm size. Additionally, this swelling causes a sensation of heaviness as well as numbness. In the photo here on the right, I have three different arms showing different percentages of swelling. Um, lymphedema is diagnosed and treatment begins when arm swelling reaches 10%. So to explain that threshold just a little bit, um, Amanda will go into it further in detail, but that 10% is in reference to what the arm size is from the baseline measurement that we take before treatment begins, and then the difference between that baseline measurement and the current arm volume size. So on the left, I have a photo of an arm that is showing 3% swelling, and this is considered a typical arm fluctuation. So arm volume sizes can fluctuate, typically between 0 and 5%, and this is healthy and not considered an aspect of lymphedema. However, here in the center, I have a photo of an arm that is showing early signs of swelling at 11%. This 11%, again, is greater than the 10% quantitative measurement of lymphedema. So this does constitute lymphedema. 
However, this swelling is certainly in its early stages, so it is much easier to treat in this stage. On the far right, I have a photo of an arm that is showing much more progressive swelling at 33% larger than its original arm size. This stage is a lot harder to treat for lymphedema um, because some of the tissue changes, some of the tissue in the arm actually begins to change due to this fluid buildup of lymph. So again, it is important um, to screen and try and catch lymphedema signs and symptoms at its earliest stages. So we've talked about what breast cancer related lymphedema is, it is now important to discuss the risk factors. So as mentioned before, um, breast cancer related lymphedema can come from the, any treatment to the lymph nodes. So that includes a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is when the surgeon samples some of the lymph nodes in the underarm area, axillary lymph node dissection, which is when the surgeon actually removes the lymph nodes from the underarm area, as well as regional lymph node radiation, which is radiation that is directly targeted to the lymph nodes. And these treatments, again, interrupt the lymphatic system, which results in the lymph fluid not being able to flow as well throughout the body and can accumulate in the arm. Additional risk factors include obesity at the time of diagnosis. So if a patient is experiencing obesity, which is clinically defined as a body mass index of greater than or equal to 25 at the time of diagnosis, then they have been shown to be more likely to develop lymphedema. Additionally, cellulitis infection, which is an infection in the skin, can result in more likely um, development of lymphedema or lymphedema flare-ups. Additionally, pre-existing swelling can also be a risk factor for lymphedema. This risk timeframe, as mentioned, is most significant during the first five years post-treatment, and the risk is lifelong, but gets substantially less severe. The risk gets substantially less significant after that five-year timeframe. Here, I have a graph that represents the numerical risk values per treatment intervention. So on the left, I have sentinel lymph node biopsy, which reveals a 5 to 8% risk um, of developing lymphedema. Moving one over to the right, we have sentinel lymph node biopsy in addition to regional lymph node radiation, and that increases the risk to about 11%. We can see further over one more, the axillary lymph node dissection risk is approximately 25%. And then finally, axillary lymph node dissection and regional lymph node radiation results in approximately 30% risk of developing lymphedema. Additionally, um, there is an aspect of race and ethnicity that is involved in the risk of breast cancer-related lymphedema. Studies have shown that women of color, particularly Black and Hispanic women, experience higher rates of breast cancer-related lymphedema, which was initially understood to be because they were more likely to undergo axillary lymph node dissection, which, if you remember from the previous slide, is 25% risk as opposed to sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is about 5 to 8% risk. However, Memorial Sloan Kettering recently released that research that Black women are at higher risk of breast cancer-related lymphedema independent from their surgical interventions. So further work certainly needs to be done to better understand this relationship, but it is something that is coming to light. So we've talked about what BCRL is, we've talked about what the risk factors look like, now let's talk about treatment. So there are many treatment goals, um, and here I'll outline some of the overall goals. First, treat early. As mentioned before, it is much easier to treat lymphedema when it is caught early rather than its progressive swelling stage. So catching it early and beginning treatment early, again, increases the likelihood of better symptom improvement um, and relieving those symptoms. Other goals include maximizing the quality of life for our patients. So that includes improving their symptoms, reducing that swelling, reducing um, those sensations of heaviness and numbness, as well as decreasing limb swelling and size, um, additionally decreasing the risk of infection. Sorry, um, as well as decreasing the risk of infection and then ultimately achieving self-management for the patient and the patient's arm health, and that is done by establishing a lifelong knowledge of treatment options. So the overall structure of treatment for breast cancer-related lymphedema um, has two phases, one, the reduction phase, and two, the self-care phase. So the first goal in the reduction phase is to reduce swelling. 
Again, this treatment begins when arm volume difference measures greater than 10%. So I have a photo here on the left of our parameter, which Amanda will explain further. Um, but so when a patient measures 10% on that parameter, they then begin treatment for lymphedema. Um, the methods for reducing swelling include manual lymph drainage and massage. This is done with a certified lymphedema therapist, and it is hands-on work to promote the fluid of, in the arm to circulate throughout the body and stop accumulating in the arm. Additionally, um, another method is compression wrapping. I have a photo of this here on the right. Um, this intervention is intensive and yet short-term. So this wrapping, looks very intense, you're correct. However, it does not. it is not a long-term solution. It is just for that initial reduction phase to bring the arm down to approximately 10% or below. The second phase of treatment is the maintenance and self-care phase. So we see here on the right, I have a patient whose arm is now down to about 10% or below. So they are back down to what their initial arm size is, for was prior to treatment and prior to swelling. And then this patient is wearing a compression sleeve. And this compression sleeve serves to keep arm volume down and try and prevent flare-ups from lymphedema. Additionally, um, good skin care is helpful in the self-care self phase. Um, as mentioned, the cellulitis infection can can promote lymphedema flare-ups, and so skin care to prevent cellulitis infection is important alongside exercise in order to keep the arm health so that the arm size can stay down. Again, here on the left, I've included a photo of the parameter. This is important because once patients have entered the maintenance and self-care phase, it is important for them to still be in the screening program. This is because we can make sure that their self-care and maintenance is up to par with what needs to happen so that their arm volume is in fact staying down. And it also helps us monitor to make sure that there are no flare-ups. All right. So another aspect of breast cancer related swelling is breast edema. So similar to arm lymphedema, swelling can also occur in the breast. This can happen as a side effect of lumpectomy or any breast conserving surgery. However, it is often overlooked due to post-surgical swelling. This breast edema is difficult to measure and difficult to screen. And with that said, there is little research available for breast edema. However, for the patients who do experience breast edema, the symptoms can be moderate to severe. Treatment for breast edema is similar to that of treatment for arm edema, um, but with one of the main focuses on compression. So I have here a photo of a patient wearing a compression bra, which serves a similar purpose for the compression sleeves shown earlier to try and reduce the swelling in the area. Additionally, kinesio tape can be used to promote fluid movement throughout the body and stop accumulating in the breast, as well as manual and hands-on therapy done by a certified lymphedema therapist. So as the, although we don't know best practice for breast edema, there is little, because there is little research about it, treatment is typically motivated by symptom reduction um, for patients on an individual basis. So with that said, I'm excited to hand it off to Amanda, who will be able to talk about the lymphedema screening program that we have here at Mass General. Thank you, Ibby. Um, so as Ibby mentioned, treatment for lymphedema early is really key to better health outcomes. And the only way we can treat early is if we are screening. And so today I will be speaking about our lymphedema screening program at Mass General. So why do we screen for lymphedema? In the photo on the right, we see moderate to severe lymphedema with more swelling that results in tissue changes and likely moderate to severe symptoms. Lymphedema at this stage is significantly harder to treat. In contrast, in the photo to the left, because this patient, oh sorry, in the photo to the left, um, this patient has early signs of lymphedema with some swelling, but it hasn't yet become too severe, which makes it easier to treat and more likely to be reversible. We screen for lymphedema so that we can catch it early, like in the photo to the left, to hopefully achieve better outcomes for patients. So what is lymphedema screening and what does it specifically entail? There are four components that together form a screening program and each play a role in a lymphedema diagnosis. 
First, patients are asked about symptoms, particularly those that may be indicative of swelling, such as heaviness or tightness of the arm. Second, we use objective measurements, such as arm volume over time, to look for any small changes. Third, providers such as physicians or certified lymphedema therapists provide clinical examinations. And lastly, a key aspect that is really central to our screening program is patient education and vigilance between follow-up visits. We want patients to know their individual risk factors and most importantly, when to call us and their providers when they notice small changes and or subtle signs of swelling. There are many benefits to screening. First, and we'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but screening is really critical to an accurate diagnosis. Second, screening enables providers to detect lymphedema early when it is still reversible, resulting in better outcomes. This directly relates to quality of life as patients with lymphedema experience multiple symptoms that can impede daily activities. Additionally, when treating early lymphedema, providers can control treatment burden by having patients in the clinic less often and still provide that necessary level of care. And as previously said, when lymphedema is caught early, it is more likely to be reversible and patients thereby are able to maintain arm function. Lastly, there are lower associated costs with the screening model compared to an impairment-based model, which focuses on treatment after the diagnosis of lymphedema. Focusing a bit on the costs associated with lymphedema treatment, they can vary based on insurance coverage. For the most part, the majority of insurance plans do cover physical therapy appointments with a certified lymphedema therapist. However, should coverage be insufficient in some cases, this can result in a significant financial burden and potentially cause delays in care. Another cost is that of compression garments and supplies, a cornerstone in lymphedema treatment. Unfortunately, compression garments are often not covered by insurance. As a result, the associated costs can accumulate quickly as the garments need to be replaced every couple of months to ensure proper treatment. Lastly, transportation to appointments can result in an additional financial burden. This was briefly mentioned as part of treatment burden, but Treatment for late stage lymphedema can require multiple visits per week, which in addition to impacting quality of life can also become costly. This does not include the associated cost if someone needs to take time off of work or work reduced hours to make it to their appointments. For these reasons, we really emphasize the importance of screening so that we can catch lymphedema early and hopefully avoid some of these costs. As a reminder, lymphedema screening at Mass General is completely free and is not billed to insurance in any capacity. Another promising initiative to reduce the financial burden associated with lymphedema treatment is the Lymphedema Treatment Act. The Lymphedema Treatment Act is a proposed federal bill that aims to provide insurance coverage for compression supplies essential to lymphedema treatment Unfortunately, this bill would only expand coverage for those with Medicare. However, the hope is that it would set an important precedent and encourage Medicaid and private insurers to also cover compression supplies. Although this would be an incredible step forward in reducing the financial burden associated with lymphedema treatment, we do wanna emphasize that screening is still absolutely essential as our primary goal is to catch lymphedema as early as possible to prevent the need for such intensive and expensive treatment. So how do we screen for lymphedema? This is the parameter. It is the device we use in our clinic that calculates arm volume in milliliters. It is a quick, simple, and painless process that works by moving the white square frame over a person's arm. We measure both arms three times each and take the median arm volume for each side. We measure arm volume before surgery and at each follow-up visit. By doing this at each visit, we can tell patients if their arm volume has changed compared to their baseline preoperative measurement, and if so, by how much. So 
For example, at a follow-up visit, we'll take arm measurements and then be able to say to the patient, your arm volume has stayed the same or it has increased by 2% or 5% or 10% from your baseline measurement. Patients are typically referred to a certified lymphedema therapist. If their arm volume increases by 10% from baseline, um, they can also be referred if their arm volume has increased between five and 10% from baseline and they're experiencing symptoms indicative of swelling. Again, lymphedema screening at MGH is a completely free service for any past or current patients at Mass General. So I've talked a lot about a baseline or preoperative arm measurement. This is because screening starts at breast cancer diagnosis and our team strongly advocates for the use of a preoperative baseline measurement because we found that women can have a significant natural arm asymmetry. In 2016, we found that of 1,028 women screened for lymphedema prior to breast surgery, 28% had one arm greater than or equal to 5% larger than the other arm, and 3% had one arm greater than or equal to 10% larger than the other. So if we don't know a patient's natural arm asymmetry and providers and certified lymphedema therapists are diagnosing based on those small initial volume changes of five to 10%, that can result in significant errors or misdiagnoses. In fact, in this study, we found a 40 to 50% misdiagnosis rate when a preoperative measurement was not included. Therefore, we believe a preoperative baseline arm measurement is absolutely essential. So this illustrates the general structure of our screening program. We see patients before surgery to obtain that preoperative baseline measurement. We see them after surgery at their post-op post visit, after finishing radiation, after finishing chemotherapy, and at each oncology follow-up visit for about five years, as we know this window of time is when lymphedema is most likely to develop. During their post-op visit, we know a patient's risk factors based on their surgery type. Oh, can you go back one slide, sorry. Um, so we know a patient's risk factors based on their surgery type. Um, so we take this opportunity to talk to them about those individual risk factors, what symptoms to look out for, how they typically manifest, and when they should reach out to us and their oncology provider should they notice any changes. We continue to provide arm measurements and symptom questionnaires throughout the follow-up visits as part of our screening process. So our lymphedema screening program at Mass General has screened over 6,000 women since its inception in 2005. We aim to consistently screen and follow women for five years after surgery, as this is when breast cancer related lymphedema is most likely to develop. However, we continue to screen women for as long as we're able to past that five year period. A key aspect to our program is the ability to facilitate timely care coordination when needed, which is only possible because we screen patients continuously. There are three typical ways this happens. First, when one of the research coordinators, either Brooke, Ibby, or myself, measures an increased arm volume, and or if a patient mentions any symptoms indicative of early swelling, we reach out directly to physical therapy and their providers for a referral. Second, because patient education is essential to our screening program, many patients reach out themselves if they notice symptoms in between follow-up visits and are then asked to come in for arm measurements and a clinical evaluation by a provider. Third, physical... Physicians and nurse practitioners provide direct referrals and occasionally request our measurements to provide more information with that referral. Given the experience gained in our program, we strongly advocate that lymphedema screening must be standard of care. This philosophy has been adopted by the following organizations, the National Lymphedema Network, 
International Society of Lymphology, American Society of Breast Surgeons, National, the Not National Comprehensive Care Network, and the National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers. These are major domestic and international organizations that are leaders in developing guidelines for patients treated for breast cancer. However, unfortunately, lymphedema screening is still not standard of care and only a few institutions have a lymphedema screening program. We need to listen to the guidelines set by these organizations and our program will continue to advocate for screening as standard of care so that more institutions than not have a lymphedema screening program. As lymphedema screening is standard of care here at Mass General, this is an illustration of the number of measurements we've performed per year in the last five years. In the yellow are the number of new patients or new baseline measurements taken each year, while the green indicates the number of follow-up measurements per year. As you can see, between 2017 and 2019, the number of new baseline and follow-up measurements trend upward as we're seeing more and more patients. When COVID hit in 2020, the numbers dropped significantly as our clinic had to close for four months, resulting in a significant disruption of care. In 2021, when we began to recover, we see the number of measurements start to increase, but did not fully return to the level of 2019. Interestingly, the number of new baseline patients in 2021 rebounded quickly to exceed that of 2019, as many women who had to delay care during 2020 were coming in with new breast cancer diagnoses. The number of follow-up measurements, however, remained low, as women were still hesitant to return to the clinic for in-person visits. This slide illustrates a similar finding by looking at monthly screening numbers between 2019 and 2021. The orange line represents 2020, and you can see the significant dip during the height of the pandemic and subsequent closure of our clinic between mid-March and mid-June. What is hopeful, however, is that by December of 2021, the number of measurements per month were similar to that of 2019, indicating that at least some patients felt comfortable returning in person to their follow-up visits and were able to be screened. And so now I would love to hand it off to my colleague, Brooke, who will be talking about some of the research our team has been doing around breast cancer-related lymphedema and the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Amanda. Our team conducted the LymphVac study or patient experiences with the COVID-19 vaccination after breast cancer treatment. To give some background as to why we decided to conduct this study, when the vaccine first came out, we received several concerning emails from providers with patients who were experiencing lymph node swelling after receiving the COVID vaccine. This is a known side effect of the mRNA, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccines. However, swelling is highly concerning for breast cancer patients. We also had several questions regarding where on the body to receive the vaccine. As previously, patients have been told to avoid the arm on the side of breast cancer treatment. However, with this new vaccine that is unlike others and that lymph node swelling is a side effect, we wanted to see if there was any difference in side effects in the breast cancer population from the general population. As lymphedema is a disease of the lymphatic system, how would this vaccine, which targets lymph nodes, affect patients who have had lymph nodes removed? Why do lymph nodes swell after the mRNA, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccines? I do want to note that lymph nodes also swell after other vaccines, such as the flu vaccine. However, the immune response after the COVID vaccine is greater, so we're seeing this side effect more so in this population. Lymph nodes contain white blood cells and they are part of our immune system and the lymphatic system is the largest part of the immune system. So these um, blood cells recognize the antigen and they start to fight and create antibodies. And all of this cellular activity can lead to inflammation and swelling in the lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes which are most likely to swell are those closest to the injection site. 
So in this case, either the supraclavicular or on top of the collarbone lymph nodes or the axillary lymph nodes under the arm are the most likely to swell. And this is a sign that the immune system is acting as it should when an injection is given. So because of all of this, we worked with several institutions to put together guidelines for receiving the vaccine. For patients with lymphedema or at risk of lymphedema, we recommended receiving the vaccine in the arm opposite the side of treatment or in the leg. And for patients who had bilateral treatment, we recommended receiving the vaccine in the leg or on the side of treatment which had fewer lymph nodes removed. However, we still wanted to learn more about patient experiences with the vaccine. Thus, we conducted this study starting in April 2021, and we are still collecting data, but for the purposes of this presentation, we are looking at data collected through February 2022. And this data is not yet published. So the purpose of this study is to elicit patient experiences and side effects associated with the vaccine after breast cancer surgery. We sent over 4,000 surveys over, over several months in 2021 to women over the age of 18 who have received breast cancer treatment and who have been screened at least once in our program at MGH. These are the demographics of the 616 participants whose data we analyzed for this presentation. I've bolded 57% of participants with a body mass index greater than 25, 27% of participants who received axillary lymph node dissection, and 25% of participants who received regional lymph node radiation, which are all known risk factors for lymphedema. And this is a representative sample of the breast cancer population. You'll notice also there is some missing data, which we are in the process of collecting. However, that does not impact um, the analysis for today's presentation. The data we collected was threefold. First, we wanted to learn more about participants' decisions regarding where to receive the vaccine. Second, we collected data on side effects after each dose of the vaccine. And lastly, we asked specifically about lymph node swelling after each dose of the vaccine. So starting with decisions about the vaccine, about 38% of participants received the Moderna vaccine and 54% received the Pfizer vaccine. While we did collect data on the 8% of participants who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we do not include them in this analysis as this was a small subset of the population and lymph node swelling was not a concern after this vaccine. This graph represents the body part where participants received the first dose of their vaccine. Our team is interested in this because for years, patients have been told to avoid medical procedures in the at-risk arm or the arm on the side, um, on the same side as breast cancer treatment. Our research has previously shown that medical procedures should be performed on the opposite side to treatment when possible as a precautionary measure. However, this does not necessarily apply to this new vaccine, which specifically targets the lymph nodes. 77% of participants received the first dose of the vaccine in the arm opposite um, to the side of breast cancer treatment, as was recommended in our guidelines. And this is shown in the yellow portion of the graph. Of the 22% who received the vaccine in the same side as treatment, shown in green, for the majority, or 82% of them, this was also their non-dominant arm, which we anticipate is the main reason this arm was chosen. And the data was very similar for dose two, which I won't present at this time. Participants at higher risk for lymphedema, so those who received axillary lymph node dissection, were more likely than those at lower risk to receive the vaccine in the arm opposite to the side of breast cancer treatment. And this was a statistically significant difference between all three groups of axillary dissection, sentinel biopsy, and no nodal surgery. Also in all groups, more participants received the vaccine in the opposite arm than the same side as treatment. Additionally, although very few participants received the vaccine in the leg, or this 1% shown in gray, the reasons reported were taking into account the side of treatment, lymphedema, and one participant mentioned that she had upcoming breast imaging and did not want the vaccine to impact her lymph nodes before this. So looking a little more closely at the option to receive the vaccine in the leg, 
In April 2021, the co-directors of our lymphedema program at MGH were quoted in this New York Times article explaining our guidelines as to why the vaccine may be administered in the leg, provided it is near some of the hundreds of lymph nodes that exist in the body. The upper thigh, for example, is located near multiple lymph nodes and has already been shown to generate an effective immune response after vaccination. However, some of these comments on the article, which say, starting to feel like I've had a, I'd have a better chance of winning the lottery, and it's been beyond frustrating to try to get a shot in my thigh, show how difficult it was for vaccine providers to accommodate the request for vaccine in the leg, which is why our numbers for leg vaccines may be so low, and it's definitely something to think about if and when booster doses become recommended again in the future. Furthermore, 90% of participants chose where to receive the vaccine, which is encouraging data that patients are advocating for themselves. And this graph shows what impacted participants' decisions on where to receive the vaccine. So almost half of the population reported that the side of breast cancer treatment impacted their decision, which is shown in green. However, arm dominance in yellow here still did have a larger impact than both risk of lymphedema and having lymphedema, shown in gray and orange. This could be a potential area for further education, as the majority of participants, or close to 73%, were not given advice on where to receive the vaccine, and we do need to improve on this in the future. We next analyzed side effects of the vaccine. So this was our list of side effects, which were all listed in a phase three study on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines done in the general population. So the results of this general population study are in the New England Journal of Medicine. And keep in mind that these studies analyzed side effects from thousands of people over the age of 16 in the general population, including healthy individuals and those with stable chronic medical conditions and reported data for seven days after receiving the vaccine. We asked about all the same side effects because we wanted to know if the breast cancer population would experience side effects differently than the general population. Additionally, our lymph vac study asked about these three side effects, so swelling, numbness, and heaviness of the arm, which are not included in the general population because these side effects are associated with lymphedema. These are the percentages of participants who reported having any side effect after dose one and dose two split between Moderna and Pfizer. Circled in green and gray are the data from our study and the other bars in yellow and orange show what was reported in the general population. It seems that more participants in the breast cancer population Moderna group experienced side effects compared with the general population and the opposite was true for Pfizer. However, we do not have statistics on this data, so we can't form a conclusion on whether there is a significant difference between the groups, though the numbers do look similar. And we are in the process of collecting more data on the booster vaccine that we hope to publish in the near future. Looking a little more closely at the side effects, these are the top five side effects reported in the breast cancer cohort for the Moderna vaccine after both dose one and dose two. Injection site soreness, fatigue, generalized muscle soreness, and headache were the top four for both doses one and two in the Moderna group. However, the next highest reported side effect in blue here for dose one was swelling at the injection site, and for dose two, this was chills. The number of breast cancer, um, the numbers between the breast cancer population and the general population are very similar, which is promising for our patients. In the breast cancer population and in the general population, the percentage of side effects being reported increases for dose two, which is to be expected as the immune system is more primed after receiving the first dose. Here is the same data for the participants who received the Pfizer vaccine. So the top four side effects for dose one and dose two matched the Moderna group as injection site soreness in green, fatigue in yellow, generalized muscle soreness in orange, and headache in gray. However, for dose two, headaches were more highly reported than generalized muscle soreness, which switched from dose one. 
as with Moderna, the fifth highest report is reported side effect in blue switched from arm heaviness for dose one to chills after dose two. Again, as we would expect, the percentage of side effects being reported increases for dose two in the Pfizer population as it did in the Moderna population as well. Finally, we collected data on lymph node swelling. So we asked after each dose, if participants experienced swelling, which we defined as discomfort or noticeable when looking or touching in the lymph nodes in the axilla or underarm or in the supraclavicular region or right above the collarbone. We also compared this data to the general population. However, only the Moderna group specifically asked about lymph node swelling. So we therefore compared our data for all breast cancer participants to the Moderna group for the general population. What we found was very promising that participants who had received breast cancer treatment were not more likely to experience lymph node swelling than the general population. You can see after dose one for both groups, about 10% experienced swelling, and after dose two, 13 to 14%, which again, we would expect a higher immune response after dose two. For both doses in the breast cancer population, the majority of the lymph node swelling occurred in the axilla on the same side as the vaccine. However, there were some cases in the opposite side as well. The most common duration in our study for lymph node swelling was about one week, which was just a bit of a longer de um, duration than for the general population. This graph illustrates the percentage of participants who reported lymph node swelling in yellow and who did not report lymph node swelling in green split into the three surgical types. It is promising that patients at higher risk of lymphedema, so those who had an axillary lymph node dissection, were not more likely to report lymph node swelling than those at lower risk. And we found no statistical difference between these groups um, for reporting versus not reporting lymph node swelling. So whether or not a participant experienced lymph node swelling was not dependent on type of nodal surgery. We can draw conclusions from this data, including that those participants at higher risk of lymphedema more frequently chose to receive the vaccine on the opposite arm to breast cancer treatment. Participants who had lymph node surgery did not report swelling more often than the general population and the level of lymph node surgery did not alter reports of swelling. In the future, we would like to see more structured and universal education regarding booster doses of the vaccine. And we are hoping to examine the effects that the vaccine may have on lymphedema, especially for those participants who reported lymph node swelling. However, we do have positive outcomes from this data in that there were minimal differences between the breast cancer population and the general population, which is promising for future doses of the vaccine. Finally, looking at future directions for our team at MGH, we would like to continue to raise awareness for lymphedema and make screening and treatment more accessible, which would involve expanding screening at baseline and follow-up to other institutions and making it standard of care. In addition to the continuing research we are doing with the COVID vaccine, we also have several other research studies we're currently conducting or planning to conduct in the near future. We are looking into new devices for screening for lymphedema other than the parameter, uh, which would make screening more accessible. We also currently screen patients who are receiving targeted therapies as some of these have been shown to correlate with higher rates of lymphedema. We are also planning to open a study on early physical therapy intervention before lymphedema fully develops. So for those patients measuring at a five to 10% increase in arm volume from baseline in order to keep treatment simple and more effective. As mentioned earlier, there is little to no research on breast edema. So we do plan to open a trial looking more closely at breast edema as well. Another area of investigation is the use of prophylactic sleeves after axillary lymph node dissection to see if this leads to the prevention of lymphedema. We've put um, the link to our website here, which has a page with several resources for patients with breast cancer and those experiencing breast cancer-related lymphedema. 
And finally, we'd like to thank Dr. Alphonse Tavian and Cheryl Brunel, who are the directors of the MGH Lymphedema Research Program. We've also listed our website, Twitter, and email address for any follow-up questions. We'd also like to thank all of our patients who participate in our research and everyone here for attending this presentation. Here are our references on the next slide. And finally, we'd like to take some time to answer any questions and we've asked Cheryl Brunel as well to join. Thank you. Thank you so much, A.B. and Brooke and Amanda. It was a very informative presentation. I'm just taking a look at some of the questions coming in here. Um, we do have the remaining time for questions and comments. So if you have something to ask and you haven't yet, um, please enter it into the, the chat box. Um, when measuring arm volume to diagnose lymphedema, how do you account for a patient gaining weight? Um, so I can answer that. Um, when we screen for lymphedema, we measure the arm that's at risk of lymphedema, the side of breast cancer treatment, and we also take the arm that has had no breast surgery at all um, to kind of adjust for weight. And then if patients have had breast surgery on both sides, we use a weight adjusted formula to basically account for that as well. Do you have any recommendations if you think you have lymphedema after you've already been screened for it? I can answer That's that. Um, so just to clarify, um, if the patient has already been screened for it and they think afterward that they have developed lymphedema. Um, so I would say to reach out to your provider, um, but if you do also have a screening program accessible to you, revisiting that screening program to get an updated measurement um, to have a good look to see of your arm size changes to help inform that diagnosis. Are there issues of healthcare access and quality of healthcare that help explain the racial and ethnic biases in um, lymphedema development? Um, so I can speak a bit to that. Um, as Amy mentioned, historically, kind of the disparities of rates of lymphedema was tied to surgery type, um, specifically Black and Hispanic women experiencing higher rates of axillary lymph node dissection. Um, in terms of healthcare access and quality, that can often relate because um, women of color present later in their breast cancer diagnosis and therefore require kind of those more intensive surgeries to, to take more of the lymph nodes. However, you know, because we're kind of moving away from that and Sloan Kettering found that um, lymphedema and race are connected independently of surgery type, further research is definitely needed to explore that relationship in further detail. Thank you. And I know it was mentioned a couple times in your presentation, but can you talk a bit about lymphedema of the breast separate from lymphedema of the arm? Um, how is that treated? Is there information or data available about prognosis or any other information that you're able to provide? Yes. So unfortunately, there is not as much research regarding breast edema. Um, our team is actually in the works of trying to investigate that further. A lot of this lack of research is due to an a lack of ability to screen and measure breast edema as well as we can with arm edema. Um, Cheryl, if you have anything you'd like to add in that regard to breast edema with treatment. Sure, thanks, Indy. Um, I would add that although we don't know really exactly, we don't have a treatment protocol for breast edema per se from the literature, we don't know what is best. There are a lot of different treatments we can try. And as it'd be nicely outlined, like kinesio tape, compression, I would add exercise as well. These things really, really help these patients be a lot less symptomatic. And I think breast edema is one of those things that really impacts quality of life. I won't say more than arm lymphedema, but I would say just as much because it hurts. These patients are often very symptomatic 
So coming in for treatment and just knowing that referral is important to a lymphedema therapist so that we can help to treat. And the treatment for me when I treat this is usually per the patient's symptoms. My goal is just to improve the symptoms, improve the appearance of the breast, decrease the volume, um, those kinds of things. We know from the literature that most women who report breast edema after breast conserving surgery and radiation, most are much better, certainly by two or three years post-surgery. That's a really long time to have symptoms that are quite painful. So I would encourage patients who think they may have breast lymphedema to report that to your oncology team, get a referral and see how a lymphedema therapist can help you with that. Thank you, everyone. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, are there biomarker, excuse me, biomarkers available that can help predict lymphedema before the objective arm measurement? So this is something that we are actually looking into um, as one of our research avenues. Um, as of late, we don't have a conclusive answer to that question, um, but it is something that we have been investigating. A couple more questions coming in. Um, how long can treatment for lymphedema take? Essentially, how long would a patient be coming in for treatment? So this is variable per patient um, and oftentimes variable per intensity of swelling. Um, some patients are coming in three times a week receiving these certified lymphedema therapist treatment. Um, other patients are doing so um, one time a week. And then this time frame really depends on how long the uh, reduction phase lasts for, for that patient. Um, can I still be measured um, if I don't have a baseline measure measurement? Um, yes, absolutely. So even if we don't have a baseline arm measurement, we're still able to monitor, you know, the absolute volume of both arms. And then um, because we have other aspects of our screening program that, you know, take into consideration symptoms and also clinical examination by providers, we rely more heavily on those parts, but we still always, always, always um, recommend screening. Thank you. Is lymphedema observed in other diseases or, or types of cancers? And does it inform us about how to treat um, breast cancer associated lymphedema? Does anyone specifically want to take this? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. So probably the best answer for this is yes, lymphatic diseases are a group of diseases. And that may include having lymphedema with which you're born when there is some kind of anatomic um, issue with the lymphatic system or it may be because there's been damage to your lymphatic system with other types of cancer, for instance, removal of lymph nodes and radiation to the lymph nodes. I will add that the majority of research has been done in breast cancer uh, where lymphedema is concerned by a, a far margin to the point that we really need more research done for other cancers as well, like melanoma, gynecologic cancer, head and neck cancers. The patients who have those types of cancers also suffer from lymphedema. And in fact, the, the incidence of lymphedema of the lower extremity after a gynecologic type of cancer is much higher than arm lymphedema after breast cancer. So this area needs work. And I know that us together with many other clinicians and researchers are trying to encourage in increased funding in this area. It's very hard to get funding for our research. And this is vastly needed both in breast cancer and in other diseases that cause lymphedema. It's a very underfunded and understudied phenomenon, unfortunately. Thank you. So we still have a few more minutes. Um, if anyone has a question that hasn't been addressed, um, please. Type it into the chat box. 
and a question about vaccines. Um, who should patients go to for advice on where to receive the vaccine? Yeah, so for our study, uh, we had over 60% of the participants received their advice from oncologists. Next, about 25% um, received the advice from MGH, um, for example, in the guidelines we sent out. And then um, the majority of the rest did receive advice from the, um, the person administering the vaccine. Um, so I would say definitely when vaccines involve, you know, this vaccine um, involved the lymph nodes a lot, definitely referring to the oncologist with that. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned practicing good skin care. Are there any examples of um, specific things that patients should or shouldn't do to keep up their skin care? I think I'll defer to Cheryl, who does this most often in our team. Sure, thanks, Ibi. Um, any, so I would say just really keeping the skin healthy. So keeping the skin well moisturized, we know that treatment for lymphedema dehydrates the skin. So anytime I'm having patients wear compression, especially wrapping, we're trying to really keep that skin hydrated and moisturized because dry skin can crack and that can create an opening. And we really want to avoid infection in patients who are at risk for lymphedema or with lymphedema. We know that is a risk factor for further development of lymphedema when, when there's an infection in the arm on the side of treatment. So we want to be careful with that. Um, just, you can go ahead and get manicures and pedicures, just minding that the, the sterile technique used in the facility where you're going for those um, is good. Um, and just really, so it's moisture and just taking care, accidents will happen, burns will happen, mosquito bites will happen. Um, just making sure that those things are healing well. And if you notice any type of infection or you think you might have an infection, don't wait. Go ahead and get some, seek some medical advice and try to have that treated early. If you're at risk of lymphedema and you have an infection on that side, the physician will be will be more likely to treat the infection early with antibiotics. And that's an important preventative measure. Thank you. I have a couple more questions coming in. Um, do you think your COVID vaccine observations are generalizable to all vaccines? Yes, so I think the, um, the main difference between the COVID vaccine and other vaccines and the reason we wanted to um, look specifically into this vaccine um, was because of the side effect of lymph node swelling. So it was really encouraging that um, lymph node swelling, it didn't seem um, to be more prevalent in participants with breast cancer than um, from the data in the general population. Um, so I do think that was encouraging and I think we'll continue to recommend receiving vaccines in the arm opposite to the side of breast cancer treatment whenever possible. Thank you. And can you speak a little bit to um, differences and types of edema? What is the difference between breast edema and chest wall edema um, when someone has had a mastectomy? So breast edema is swelling in the actual breast tissue. Um, regarding chest wall edema, I'll defer to Cheryl um, specifically with that differentiation. Sure, yes. So when I'm talking about breast edema, I refer to patients who've had breast conserving surgery or lumpectomy um, and who have edema within the breast, usually after radiation to the breast tissue versus chest wall edema is in patients who've had a mastectomy and who may have some swelling oftentimes up into the axilla or on the, the lateral or side of the chest. And this can be secondary to surgery. This can be secondary to radiation. Um, the treatment is very similar in that we use manual techniques, compression and exercise, and maybe kinesio tape as well. So the treatment is somewhat similar, but it's just really where the edema is pocketed or held. Thank you. And it looks like that that's um, all the time that we have for today. Libby, Amanda, Brooke, thank you so much. And Cheryl, we really appreciate you joining um, for this portion of the program. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope that the presentation was informative and helpful for you. And as Amy mentioned and put into the chat box, um, this presentation has been recorded and it will be posted to the Plum website as well as the Cancer Center website. Uh, thank you everyone again and have a great rest of your day.
拜拜。